Hi everyone. I hope we're all doing well in this time of being stuck at home. Uh, I just want to start a video series talking a little bit about multiphonics on the clarinet. Uh, I'm gonna do this kind of like a vlog and just kind of talk at you and tell you a little bit about multiphonics, how I approach multiphonics, what are some of the things I think are important to learning multiphonics, to playing multiphonics, and just some of the experiences I've had with it. <coughs> uh, some of you may or may not know, my doctoral dissertation was uh, on looking at multiphonic production on the clarinet. And so uh, there's some interesting discoveries that I'll share with you over the next few weeks. So I plan on doing this video series for maybe in five or six parts, uh, hopefully one every week, maybe every two every three weeks, something like that, uh, depending on my now non-existent schedule. Uh, anyways, I'll try to keep them relatively short, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to comment, ask, email, and I'll try to do most of this unedited too, so with some of the harder stuff, you can see just exactly how, mm, how, how difficult it is to approach them. And hopefully someone somewhere or, or everyone will have some can learn something from this uh, most of the concepts I'm gonna explain uh, I, I'll I'll try to keep it relatively short uh, if you need more explanation feel free to ask me I'm also gonna keep in mind the target audience of uh, mostly advanced clarinet students to professionals I would say uh, not necessarily geared towards the those of you who are just starting to learn the clarinet but of course you're welcome to watch this video and see all the interesting things you can do on the clarinet anyways without further ado the first video here is going to be just an introduction uh, we're not gonna do a lot of playing in this one I'm mostly gonna talk about the my, my personal philosophy behind learning and playing multiphonics some of the stuff I've run into in my research and just physical acoustic aspects uh, a little bit about the physiological aspects just to understand what multiphonics are what it can and can't do uh, those of you who are composers this might be of an interest so multiphonics what are multiphonics so multiphonics are basically well in this case, we're talking about multiphonics that are produced on the clarinet, like both pitches are produced on a clarinet. There are other ways of producing multiphonics, like uh, singing or humming. But uh, we're only going to talk about multiphonics that are produced on the clarinet, uh, both where both pitches are produced on the clarinet uh, in this video series. So stuff like... some of the more nasty ones that we're more familiar with. So those kind of multiphonics is what we're going to be talking about here. Um, I want to start by just saying that multiphonics are not just two random notes that you think would sound nice together because that's really not how it works. So we all know on the clarinet there are registers. You have the Shaw-Yumo register. And then the clarion register. And now this one. And the extreme altissimo of course. Um, but so you, you kind of have to know where each register starts um, and when you get higher up in the registers there's a little bit of overlap so with the multiphonics you can only pick a pitch from you, you can only pick, pick, pick pitches that are from different registers uh, because each register uses a different mode of vibration is what we call it um, 
in acoustic terms. So the Shariumo is the fundamental register. The clarion is the second register. So you can't have two notes both from the clarion register or two notes both from the fundamental register. Okay, that's a big mistake I see from a lot of student composers or uh, composers who are a little bit unfamiliar with clarinet multiphonics is that often they'll they'll think oh these two pitches would sound nice together but um, they would either be both from the clarion register or uh, both from the shawimo register now the exception to that rule is where the registers overlap so using the clarion register I can actually play a little higher than the C I can use the throat tone keys here and side keys to play a little bit higher and then that technically is still in the clarion register but it's notes we commonly associate with the altissimo register so when there's an overlap like that where you can play um, a pitch from either in, in uh, multiple registers so especially when you go a little bit higher in the uh, into the altissimo you can th there are notes that belong in multiple modes of vibration so you can use those um, more interchangeably and the other thing is it has to have a fingering that will work um, for example, um, some of the fingerings that require some long fingering coupled with a fingering that needs some kind of a short fingering, it's difficult to find uh, it's dif difficult to find fingerings that will make the two pitches that you need uh, with of course exceptions by using cross fingerings that we'll get into in a later, later video but yeah just I my advice to composers who are watching this right now is basically just to work with a clarinetist who uh, who are either going to play your piece or someone who is experienced with multiphonics and not just write what you think sounds nice not to mention that uh, notes that you write may sound but may not necessarily be the quality tone quality that you're looking for for example if you were to write a low e and a g at the top of the staff i can make that multiphonic sound <laughs> sound you want and it's something they can do uh, now going on for the players out there my approach to multiphonic is quite the same as approaching all my other techniques where I approach multiphonics as a whole I don't see one multiphonic in a piece and I say I will learn to play this specific multiphonic so when we learn to play the clarinet, we learn all of our scales. We learn all of the notes on the clarinet. We don't say, oh, Mozart, that is in C major. I will learn to play C major scale there. Or it's not like, uh, this piece has a G sharp. I guess I'll have to learn the G sharp. No, I already know how to play a G sharp. Okay. Uh, so with multiphonics is the same. Uh, I like to approach it so that I'm learning how to produce any multiphonic I come across rather than oh hey there's this piece that has this multiphonic. Uh, I guess I have to learn that one multiphonic. No, I have to learn all of the multiphonics. So it, it's a different mentality approach than what most people are used to or most people have thought about. Um, I think that is the correct approach. Uh, like I said, you're not learning one scale at a time. You're not learning and you're not neglecting a certain scale until you've hit it in your repertoire. Uh, you learn all of it. Okay, so it's just it. For me, it's the same for multiphonics. Uh, I have to be able to play all of them, rather than what is just asked of me. Of course, I'm not gonna be very fluent on all of them, 
but I, I, I have the tools I need to figure it out, and I know how to figure it out. Uh, yeah, so that's that. Um, so in this video series, I, I want to approach it with the same mentality where I'm going to teach you how to play, or not teach you, but explain how to play multiphonics in general rather than going into specific. Uh, maybe in one of the last videos I can go into a more specific example. Um, I'll pull out some repertoire from that stack of books over there or in this cabinet. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, uh, we're going to be talking pretty generalized concepts and whatnot in the first couple videos at least. So we talked about the acoustics a little bit, um, the multi vibration and whatnot. So I'm gonna define multiphonics. Well, I'm gonna borrow something from Farrah Watts, the type one and type two multiphonics that she wrote in her book. Let me see if I can find it. Spectral emergence. So I'm gonna steal a definition from here. Uh, the type one and type two multiphonics. So type one multiphonics are multiphonics that more or less um, use different modes of vibration, but using the same fingering. Uh, what I mean is uh, using the same tube length. Okay, so with the low E multiphonics we did earlier, uh, I have all the tone holes covered, so I'm basically more or less using the entire uh, length, the entire tube of the clarinet to generate the multiphonic, and the pitches generated are both harmonics of the low E fingering. <laughs> produce a multiphonic because this fingering can produce all of those notes okay so those are type 1 multiphonics where you're using the same tube length for both notes let me know if that was a little bit confusing. I'll explain it better in another video when we get into this type of multiphonics on how to produce them. Now the other is a type 2 multiphonic which uses a cross fingering. Uh, simply put, cross fingerings are fingerings where you're putting, you're closing tone holes after the first open tone hole. So this creates two different tube lengths. So let's say if uh, this is a common fingering that I've run into in some music, so it's the low E with the throat A key. What this does is it opens the throat A tone hole, so you're generating a short tube note. In this case, I believe is an F sharp or G or something, and also a long tube note, which is the, going to be the B. Okay. <laughs> So you have and both notes are generated with this one fingering. And then what we're doing is kind of tricking the clarinet into thinking that there's it's playing a short note, short tube note, and as well as a long tube note. Okay. Uh, another thing to know about these type of cross fingerings is what we call alternate register keys. So what the register key essentially does is it, it's basically a very small tone hole that doesn't really act as a tone hole. Well, it, you can make it act as, as a tone hole, but in the sense of normal clarinet playing, it doesn't act as a tone hole. It's just something to excite the sound wave into that second register. So, but with alternate
alternate register keys we're using usually one of the side keys or the throw keys here to act as a register key to help get that second octave note uh, well second register note so for example if I play a low C I can add the register key to play a G or I can use an alternate register key to play a G granted this alternate register key is an actual tone hole in this case I'm gonna be using the top throw key here but it, it's gonna have the same effect I can produce a pretty out of tune G from this fingering so here it is first with the register key and here it is again with the alternate register key out of tune but the idea is that we can use any of these other keys to act as a register key to put that note in fingering to excite the second mode of vibration from of that fingering so same thing with the low E I can use the A key to excite it to make it play a B So this acts as a, a, a register key, but at the same time it is still a tone hole. So we can also get that short tube note. An F quarter sharp, uh, F three quarter sharp in this case. And then we're able to produce both notes by doing this. So that is a type 2 multiphonic in Sarah's book. Um, yeah, so that's type 1 and type 2 multiphonic. Type 1 is using the same tube length and emphasizing two different pitches of the harmonic series. And type 2 uses a cross fingering and produces a short tube note and a long tube note. And just remember that both of these notes have to be from a different register. Uh, now, how we actually produce multiphonic? There are important three important parts to producing multiphonic. First one, obviously, is embouchure. Okay, how much embouchure force we're using? Um, in my study, I found that a lot. I would say most of the multiphonics can be produced without changing embouchure force. Of course, it's easier if we do change embouchure force. Well, without noticeable change in embouchure force, because I that's not something I actually tested. Uh, I went off of perception for that one. So when I was doing my research, I, I, I was just looking at voicing changes or tongue movement to see how to produce multiphonic. So I tried keeping everything else uh, to the best of my ability the same. So that's air pressure and uh, embouchure force. So I found that most of the multiphonics can be produced without changing embouchure force or air pressure. But obviously it's a little bit easier if we can add those to the equation. So yeah, embouchure force is one, air pressure is another, a lot of times multiphonics can't be produced at a very loud volume going back to that same one B with the throw A key if I play it too loud it just becomes a B uh, because the air is getting pushed past that first tone hole and it's not using that tone hole as a tone hole anymore but it's just a register key and if I play it really soft it doesn't have it if I play it too soft, then it's exactly like uh, your beginner student who can't play a long B because they haven't used enough air. Okay, so for that multiphonic specifically, it's a lot more comfortable to be played at a mezzo piano piano volume, but not 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 louder than the metal forte and not softer than a piano 
just around that middle range is where most of the multiphonic will speak very well. Um, of course, there are exceptions. The low E multiphonic works loud. But not very well soft. It, it comes out, but it's very unstable. And it and the top note is significantly more quiet than the bottom note so that is something you have to experiment with on your own uh, both for the performer and the composer and yeah I think that is pretty much it for what I want to say for this first video it's just an introduction um, the next video will get into some of the voicing exercises that I do to prepare to prepare for learning the multiphonics um, and then we'll dive into multiphonics themselves a couple of videos later and yeah just I hope you guys enjoyed this short explanation and I'll see you next week